just repeating a lead with um, uh, the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And uh, welcome to today's ISD UNEP session on um, measuring fuel subsidies in the context of the SDGs, uh, increasing transparency in times of high energy prices. We've got just one hour today and a pretty full panel of speakers. So I'll be brief with introductory remarks. Uh, I'll just touch on two quick things. Um, one, a few words on why this topic is really important. And two, a quick run through of our agenda. Um, before I jump into that, a quick alert. We will be live tweeting uh, throughout this event using the handle uh, ISD underscore energy. So uh, please tag us with your own tweets uh, at ISD underscore energy and uh, we'll do our best to promote yours as well. So first up, um, why are we here to talk about this today? Why does this topic matter? Um, uh, I think most people are familiar with the fact that fossil fuel subsidies are pretty bad news. So they're bad news for a lot of reasons. Uh, they're the equivalent of a negative carbon price. They actively encourage higher consumption and production of fossil fuels. Uh, they undermine carbon pricing. It's very hard to price carbon effectively if you're simultaneously subsidizing it. Uh, they typically benefit the rich much more than they do the poor, so they are not effective or efficient as a form of social welfare intervention. And because of all of this, they are typically a colossal waste of resources. So they are expensive and they take up a lot of money that could be used for better things. So there's a lot of consensus that fossil fuel subsidies need to go, and we are, as an international community, very good at agreeing to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. So we've got the Paris Agreement Article 2, committing to make finance flows consistent with our climate goals. Of course, fossil fuel subsidies are the opposite of this. They're a form of public financial flow that is uh, directly undermining our climate goals and that we can shift to try to shift larger private investment flows. Last year, we had the Glasgow Pact in which all UN member countries agreed to phase out their inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. We've got independent agreements dating back to 2009 from the G20 and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, let us not forget Sustainable Development Goal 12, which includes a target to rationalize inefficient fossil fuel subsidies that encourage wasteful consumption. So we are very good at agreeing to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, but where are we in terms of implementation? Um, the short news is uh, we're not doing a very good job managing our fossil fuel subsidies. I will not um, provide any spoilers now. Our colleagues from the OECD will be sharing some new numbers, some new estimates later today about the size of fossil fuel subsidies. But I can say uh, at least that they are uh, as large today as they were back in 2010. There's been ups, there's been downs, but what we're looking at today is essentially no progress from 12 years ago. So what practically can be done about this? The answer to that question is a lot of things, uh, but today we're here to talk about one thing in particular that can be done about it, and that's better uh, measurement. So we can't manage what we can't measure, and there are ways in the agreements that have been reached to try to improve the measurement of fossil fuel subsidies. The SDGs are very important here. Uh, all of the SDGs set out indicators against which governments ought to track and report on their progress. And for fossil fuel subsidies, this is indicator 12.C.1. So uh, there's a methodology under this indicator that exists and countries around the world are being encouraged to take up this measurement exercise to improve transparency and accountability. So in the event today, we wanna draw attention to this indicator. We wanna ask what can we do to better promote it and make sure that more countries are reporting under it. We wanna know what lessons uh, we can learn from the countries have already made good progress with their reporting. And we also want to know what does this mean for non-state actors. So there's a lot of civil society organizations who've been doing work for years to do their own estimates of subsidies. Uh, what do they need to know about SDG 12.C.1? So that's why this topic matters. Coming to our agenda, um, we have a fantastic group of speakers with us today. Uh, and we're going to begin by asking them to share some of their experiences with measuring fossil fuel subsidies in the context of the SDGs. Uh, in order of speaker, we welcome Claire Poudevin, fiscal policy expert with the U uh, UN Environment Programme, UNEP. Michael Mullen, special advisor to COP27 with the OECD. Laura Lizano, director uh, of Energy Planning Secretariat, Ministry of Environment with uh, and Energy uh, with Costa Rica. Claire O'Hara, a statistician uh, for Environment and Climate Division with the Central Statistics Office in Ireland. 
and Philip Gass, a lead on energy transitions with IISD. So speakers, I'm gonna to turn to you. Uh, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm gonna ask you, you can try and keep your comments brief to no more than uh, five or seven minutes. Uh, this will hopefully give us time for questions and uh, if we have time for also an open discussion about the experiences that have been shared. Uh, again, please don't forget that if you do uh, any tweeting, please tag at ISD underscore energy. And uh, for people who are online with us today, we will be monitoring the questions that come in online. So please do use the question and answer interface on Zoom. And my colleague Jonas will be flagging for us if we can take up any of your questions as well. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna invite Claire Podevin to speak uh, on behalf of UNEP. UNEP is a co-custodian of SDG indicator 12.C.1. And Claire has been leading a number of training workshops with governments around the world on how to track progress under this indicator. So over to you, Claire, to give us some background and basics on Indicator 12.C.1. Sorry, unmuting is a good start. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks for inviting UNEP to speak. Um, sorry for not being uh, present in person. My name is Ingrid Claire Podevin, and I'm part of the Economic and Trade Policy Unit of UNEP. And today I will provide you with a short update on the SDG 12C1 on the measure of fossil fuel subsidies and try and share some lessons learned after this uh, initial year of data collection. So just a, a quick recap, I won't spend too much time on this as I think um, Chris already explained sufficiently in his introduction, the importance and the why behind uh, the need for reform of fossil fuel subsidy. A little bit louder. Uh, there's a lot okay. of noise around here and I think it really help if you project a little and uh, I'll uh, at the same time see if we can increase the volume with the organizers. Thank you. Not on this. Uh, I hope it's better now. Um, so yeah, I won't get into the detail of uh, this target. Um, just a reminder that it is indeed under SDG 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. And maybe just to, fly, uh, to flag one point, which I think is quite key here. Uh, when we talk about the reform of inefficient subsidies, uh, we also want to emphasize that it needs to be done according to national circumstances, meaning that we really need to do so in a manner which uh, adapts to the specific needs of the countries and in particular of developing countries. And of course, uh, as mentioned previously, any successful reform needs to be um, uh, backed by uh, credible data and careful analysis on the state of things. And that's really the main purpose of this, uh, this indicator 12.7.1. Uh, we want to make sure that there is high quality country-led, um, country-level data that is available to inform policymaking and to measure progress over time in a matter that is, um, well, consistent. So just a few words on why we think it's it's really key for this data to be as much as possible a country-led process. Um, first of all, uh, a reminder that this, this is indeed highly technical work. Um, it requires specific knowledge on uh, the fiscal framework of the country. Um, in some cases, it requires decision-making, such as uh, with the definition of, um, of a tax benchmark. So in many cases, it's actually beyond the capacity of, of international organizations to produce in-depth data. Um, and that also relates to the second issue, which is data access. Um, it often occurs that only governments have access to some of the key data. Um, for instance, it is not um, if, if, if the data is not published or if it's not published in a sufficiently disaggregated manner. Um, so really, governments have a, a, a favored uh, access to, to the relevant information. And that brings me to the third point, which is the issue of ownership. Um, rather than endorsing third party data, governance, governments will likely have um, a higher level of, uh, of ownership and endorsement of data that they produce themselves. Um, and the reason is so important is because, um, of course, measuring fossil fuel subsidies is a technical exercise, but it also leads to um, the topic of reforming it is really a politically sensitive one. And so to ensure that there is strong ownership and, and credibility of the data is, is key here. Um, just a few quick words on the methodology itself. I, I won't get into the detail, but um, a reminder that as custodian agency, UNEP is responsible for uh, supporting and leading the collection of the data. Um, uh, so maybe a, a quick reminder that um, when this indicator was adopted, we did have a number of, um, of data sources 
uh, already produced by different agencies uh, who were producing and are still producing really, really good data and research on fossil fuel subsidies, of course, by the OECD, but also the International Agency, um, the International Energy Agency, the IMF. We also had some um, a number of regional and national level initiatives. But the fact is that there was no globally approved um, comparable data set using a single methodology. And that was why the first step that was taken was to develop um, between UNEP, the ISD, and the OECD, this methodology um, that was then published in 2019. Um, so the methodology sets uh, the definition and the scope regarding, for example, what counts as a fossil fuel subsidy and what does not. Um, there can sometimes be some variation between agencies on that. Um, it provides a typology on, on the, the different types of subsidies, which really is the base for the reporting. So that's um, this is really the key document for, for this specific indicator. Now, a few words on the SDG 12 hub, which I think is, uh, is quite relevant if you're not familiar with it. Um, so this is a platform where data for all SDG 12 indicator uh, gets reported and, and uploaded. Um, so for now, for 12C1, we are still using a compilation of existing sources, um, I mean global sources, so from OECD, IEA or IMF. Um, and this, the idea that it will be progressively replaced with national level data as more and more countries start to report. So uh, I won't get into the detail maybe for the sake of time um, of, of the data uh, uh, reporting process, but just to say that the, the data collection was initiated last year, at the end of last year, um, and we are now reviewing the data that was submitted uh, with the, uh, the objective to um, have it published um, sometimes in March next year. And I think here the key number is really that um, very few countries reported, uh, which is not surprising. I mean, this is indeed a new indicator and new process and this will be an iterative process but so five countries reported uh, fairly complete data six countries reported zero dollars of subsidies in a way that is quite often contradicted by other sources such as the OECD inventory um, we do have a few countries who requested a time extension as they are currently working on the data collection as well as some countries who indicated that they would submit through the OECD who is also actively supporting countries in this process but the the conclusion here is that we do we need to do a lot more efforts in this uh, in this reporting process and um, as a finishing slide, maybe uh, just a few lessons learned so far. Um, first of all, original trainings that we provided this year uh, across different regions um, show that it is clear that um, additional support uh, needs to be provided. Uh, many countries still don't have the full capacity for monitoring, in particular in developing countries, um, especially when databases often have to be started from scratch, really. Um, and of course, the UN, but also the OCD, IASD, and other partners will continue um, efforts to, to support that regional and, and country level. Um, a second aspect is really more at the government level um, regarding intra-governmental coordination. So while the compilation is done by statistical offices, um, fossil fuel subsidies related data really often comes from a variety of sources and institutions, including but not limited uh, to ministries of finance, environment, energy, uh, tax agencies, customs agencies. So depending on the national institutional context, it really varies. And we have observed that sometimes um, there can be some issues of silos. Uh, for example, uh, if data is being prepared by one department without um, yeah, the units uh, reporting the SDGs data being aware of it, um, additional uh, an additional internal coordination would probably really help on, on, on that aspect. And on the other hand, we, we did also see some really positive steps uh, taken by, by some countries, for example, with the creation of, uh, of um, cross-agency working committees. I think we will hear uh, more examples of that later in, the, in, in, in this event. Um, finally, um, two last points. The first one being data gaps. Um, so some data is definitely um, less, some types of data is less available uh, than, than others, that is clear. Uh, for example, the case of tax expenditure, which is one of the types of subsidy um, is um, indeed more difficult to measure. And on that, it's really something that needs to be addressed at the country level and not only for the sake of, of this indicator only, but overall for fiscal transparency purposes. And finally, just to say that we will continue our effort to, to communicate this import, the importance of, uh, of having credible data and fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and I think events like this one are really an excellent example of this. So thank you again to your ISD for organizing that. 
But um, yeah, I will stop here this presentation and I remain available for any question you may have later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, for folks who are with us in person, I know the sound isn't great. We've done our best to get it up, but don't be shy. Also, feel free to come forward and get closer. The closer you are, the easier it will be to hear, also to see the screen. Um, uh, Claire, one thing that I don't know if everybody would have caught, but just can you repeat again, like where are we in terms of the SDG reporting? So how many countries now have um, submitted uh, estimates under the indicator? So concretely, we, so we received 10 submissions, but half of them were actually reporting uh, zero dollars of subsidies, which I think is something that we would need to be digging a bit more in. Uh, and five countries reported what seemed to be a fairly um, um, uh, uh, in-depth uh, type of reporting, I would say. And so we have five to 10 more countries who are currently actively working on it and we're actually providing technical assistance on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire. So yeah, I mean, 10, 10 submissions of which five said zero subsidies. So I think that really underlines some of the points you made yourself about the need for support as well for a larger number of countries to comply with this uh, indicator. So thank you so much for that background. I'm gonna to turn to Michael. So uh, the OECD, as you mentioned, of course, has got a long history of tracking and reporting on all kinds of subsidy support measures, including fossil fuel subsidy estimates. Uh, so we, we all owe a great debt to the really hard work the OECD has done in this area. Um, I should mention before uh, Michael speaks that uh, ISD has partnered with the OECD on a website called the Fossil Fuel Subsidy Tracker site, where you can find the most up-to-date data on fossil fuel subsidies. So that is fossilfuelsubsidytracker.org. Uh, and that brings together different data sets from the IEA, OECD, and the IMF. But uh, over to you, Michael. Uh, what do the latest data tell us on where subsidies are going? And uh, is there any new data uh, that you can let us know about for 2021? Uh, do you want to just speak at the podium? Uh, just ask you. Okay, everyone, I'll try and project because uh, we have some strong competition from the uh, US pavilion, it looks like. Um, anyway, great pleasure to be here this, this afternoon. I fear that Chris has slightly spoiled the surprise. We do have new data. In terms of what it says, I'm afraid, yeah, well, well, let's just see. Okay, so as a starting point, we have a long history of collecting this data. It's very much done as a collaboration between our environment and our trade and agriculture directorates. We have data on 1,500 support measures covering 51 countries. Encourage you to check it out. Also to mention that we have a collaboration with the International Energy Agency covering 82 countries and 92% of um, world energy supplies. And as Chris mentioned, this feeds into the IISD data set. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we go. Um, as kind of uh, foreshadowed, not good news. We've seen a 27% rise in fossil fuel subsidies up to 227 billion. I would also highlight that there is an unprecedented level of producer support, um, which has risen to 66 billion, um, driven, we believe, by offsetting the effect of uh, price controls. And next slide, please. Okay, and so this is from the broader data set joint with IEA. I mean, the basic story is a pretty similar one. It's uh, sadly a uh, unfortunate one. Subsidies are 731.6 billion in 2021. Um, and I think one can very easily draw the comparison between levels of dedicated climate finance, which are below the 100 billion, and subsidies, many of which, if not all, are environmentally harmful at 731.6 billion. This is almost doubling from 2020, where it was um, 392 billion. Now, we've seen a big increase in consumption subsidies. I think we all know why this is a bad thing, driven by rising fuel prices, rebounding economic activity, and of course the emergency measures that have been put in place um, to deal with fuel price spikes. 
you'll see on the chart, um, of course, we don't have the data for 2022, but if we look at the trajectory of fuel prices, um, I fear on track for potentially even worse figures um, next year. So with that, sorry to be here as the bearer of bad tidings, but I think there's a saying of some French philosopher of, even if we haven't learned anything pleasant, at least we've learned something new. So in that spirit, I hand the word back to you, Chris. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure if I should say thank you for that <laughs> really depressing news, Michael. Uh, but no, I mean, really, thank you. I think that the, the work that OECD has been doing to create data in this space is incredibly important. I think it's very important that we really know how little progress we're making, because if we don't have that data, uh, things really aren't going to change. Uh, I think just to reiterate the numbers you shared, I believe it was USD uh, 732 billion is the latest estimate. Yeah. 2021. Uh, and this is a, an update from the uh, previous, most recently available data, which was for a smaller number of economies. So now it covers 82 economies. So um, obviously, I'm also very struck by the comments you made that uh, it, it will almost certainly be a lot worse. In uh, 2022, we've always seen subsidies follow prices. So um, I think that's really striking and it really just shows the impetus for pushing forward with better me measurement and hopefully better management. So this is a good opportunity to t turn to some of um, the folks we have online with us today who've been doing their best at a national level to improve reporting. So uh, I'd like to invite Laura Lizano uh, from Costa Rica to say uh, some words for us. I should uh, add that Costa Rica is a long-term proponent of fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, it's a member of the group, the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, which has for many years been encouraging G20 and APEC members to follow through on their commitments. Uh, and um, Costa Rica has uh, been preparing its own reporting on uh, indicator 12.C.1 over the last year. So, uh, Laura, uh, what can you tell us about the experiences you've had? Uh, what lessons have you learned that might be useful for, for other countries going through the same process? Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will make a, a brief presentation to show you, to try to answer that question. So just tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, I think so, right? So, um, we can good afternoon. This yes, <laughs> good afternoon again. Um, and thank you very much for inviting us to share Costa Rica's experience in this panel. I'm Laura Lizano. I'm the director of the Energy Planning Secretariat at the Ministry of Environment and Energy in Costa Rica. Um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the institutional roles that uh, we have regarding SDGs. The Ministry of Planning is the technical secretariat of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the, the ministry has the support of the advisory body uh, for all everything that has to do with statistical and guidelines for generating and updating of the SDGs from the National Institute of Statistics and Census. Then there is also the, the Ministry of Environment and Energy that of course uh, we have been reporting SDG 7, but so far we haven't reported SDG 12 C1. And there are other institutions, which of course have a very important role providing information for this uh, indicator. Um, in March 2021, UNEP, IISD, and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean organized a training that was mentioned before. And uh, this training uh, showed us about the document uh, that, we, that Claire was explaining uh, before and the template that should be filled out by the countries. Um, many institutions from us, from Costa Rica, uh, participated in that training. Uh, in May uh, 2021, Costa Rica was accepted to be a member of OECD. So uh, uh, our authorities at that moment decided that we should participate in the informal task team of the measurement of fossil fuel subsidies. 
which um, we 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 participate. We are participating actually. Uh, when I was uh, there, the first thing that um, that I realized is that uh, the need for a national team, because this is not a, a thing about all, only energy. Of course, we need the participation of many institutions and uh, the, uh, the inputs and the expertise from different uh, professionals and backgrounds. So what we did is to call on institutions to participate. We had a very, very good response regarding this. And this team is um, it's, uh, working, it's still working. Uh, we have the Ministry of Environment and Energy, of course, but three units from them, it's from us, or it's the National Center for Environmental Information. The Office of the Minister was participating as well and uh, the Energy Sector Planning Secretariat uh, that um, I represent. And then the, the, we also had participation of the Ministry of Finance, very important. The Ministry of Foreign Trade that has been um, uh, working with topics about fossil fuels for some time. Uh, the Regulatory Authority of Public Services, the Central Bank of Costa Rica, the National Institute of Statistics and Census, census which I mentioned before. So what are the objectives of this group? Uh, we want, we focus on standardizing definitions, like what are we talking when we talk about fossil fuel subsidies, taxes, we reviewed uh, different documents. Um, we have uh, also uh, the task of identifying information providers, and of course, try to develop capacities um, the, another objective is, is to have statistical processes and instruments uh, in an harmonized way, way between institutions. And of course, very important that this group uh, will support decision making. What have we done um, so far? We had the first meeting in June 2021. During that year, we had 10 meetings. Uh, this sounds a lot. We were meeting two every two weeks, but this is because we were sharing information uh, among institutions and uh, what we have done in every, every institution, uh, what initiatives and what interests we have regarding subsidies. In 2022, we had the consultancy from UNEP and IISD, which reviewed the template that we already had uh, began to fill and gave some feedback about it. And overall, we had an uh, additional four meetings uh, in 2022. That is, of course, less meetings, but we were really working on filling out the template. And now we have a draft of the template. And uh, just to, to tell you a little bit uh, about what we found uh, when we were filling this template, of course, we, we gather already the country information, the GDP evolution, energy supply, energy consumption. Um, but um, the, most, uh, the most important thing that we identify is the, the amounts of the tax expenditures. There are some laws um, behind this. Uh, there is, in Costa Rica, there is um, a tax on fossil fuel, um, only one fixed for every single type of fuels. But this tax is not charged to airlines, to fishers, to international organizations and diplomatics. Uh, if the fuel is going to be used to export, it's not charged either. Or if it's going to be used by Recope, which is our national petrol uh, uh, institution, or the Red Cross or other institutions. Uh, another thing that we found is uh, that we calculated is the electricity subsidy for low consumptions. Um, in Costa Rica, for the residential area, if the family spends less than 280 kilowatt hour per month, then they don't have to pay the aggregate value task. So, um, but of course in Costa Rica, we have 99 or more than 99% electricity mix renewable. So that means that we have to charge it only for the, the, the percentage which uh, is generated with fossil fuels. 
So this is a, a small amount. Nevertheless, we wanted to, to present it in the template. And also we have found that there are some diver, differential prices that the, for example, the fishers um, don't uh, pay for the real cost of the fuels that they use in their boats and neither the, the users of uh, LPG or fuel oil um, who pays for this is the other users for uh, gasoline and diesel, which means it's a cross subsidy. And finally, to, to finish the presentation, we, I would like to mention that we have identified other things, other subsidies that we put in the template, but we haven't been able to calculate it yet. But we understand that this is a, a, an interactive process and we will keep improving the template uh, year after year. So this is related to the tax deduction for property uh, of some vehicles and uh, the, the fact that we have a lower tax for diesel compared to gasoline, which is really not related to carbon content. So it's, it's something that we would like to look on um, uh, further. So uh, I think that it was uh, the last slide. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think that was a really fantastic insight into also how complicated this exercise is, uh, the sheer number of ministries and agencies who are involved in your process, the fact that you had a timeline running from uh, June of uh, 2021 through to November 2022, so collecting uh, this kind of statistical information, building up the capacity of different agencies to understand it, to produce it, does take time. Uh, and I think also we saw how beneficial it is really drilling down to a point where we're not just talking about aggregate figures, but really you've been identifying, you know, very specific tax policies that with this level of discrete data, you can now take up, you know, individual conversations about, uh, and that's the, the sensible pathway to policy change. So, I mean, thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences. I'll now turn to Claire O'Hara, who is a statistician with the Environment and Climate Division of the Central Statistics Office in Ireland. Uh, to introduce Claire, I'll say as well that Ireland has a very long history of reporting on its fossil fuel subsidies, with uh, CSO data um, stretching back to 2000. So uh, Claire, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences preparing reporting for indicator 12.C.1? Uh, you know, in particular, it would be interesting to know uh, was anything strikingly similar uh, or, or different to the experiences in Costa Rica? Hi, thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, I'd be delighted and thanks very much for um, the opportunity now to tell you about our work in the Central Statistics Office in Ireland here today. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of background about how we got started in this work and what we've ended up with and some of the challenges um, that we came across along the way. So where this started for us really was that, um, you know, here in the CSO, we compile data for Eurostat statistical modules on environmental subsidies and environment taxes and, you know, similar kind of measures. Um, environment subsidies, you know, they support the environment, biodiversity and so on. So the obvious kind of counterpart to that then is, you know, um, subsidies that might support harm to the environment or damage to the environment. And from a statistical point of view, we want to quantify, you know, each of those kind of um, measures. But unfortunately, the, you know, well, the, the Eurostat modules are, are, are very well founded. They're based on the UN system of environmental economic accounting. That framework stops short of, you know, definitions or methods for compiling data on um, harmful subsidies. So we had to look at where to begin. And for our Eurostat environmental subsidies module, we had you know, we had an, an intern here who she trawled through government accounts, government reports, um, public bodies, um, you know, reports from the tax agency and academic reports and so on. And she identified, you know, line by line measures and policies and specific programs um, in that case that were supporting um, environmental protection. As we were looking at all of those, you know, um, reports and so on, the measures that were harming the environment also, you know, were there and could be seen and could identify them as we're going along. So we could see that was, you know, a place, a place to start. We also built and worked done by the OECD and methodology and, you know, the data collection that had already been done by in, in the OECD inventory of fossil fuel supports. And we brought all that together to produce a report on damaging subsidies in 2018. Um, but we felt that 
the definition um, of those kind of, you know, damaging subsidies need to be tightened up. So with the SDG reporting on the horizon and policy needs and, you know, the better kind of clearer definition of, of the environmental effect of fossil fuels, we, we focused on fossil fuel subsidies from, for, for the moment. So in the end, we, um, you know, ended up with a, we, we published an annual statistical release. We have three indicators in it for what we're talking about today. The important one is the first one there, that's fossil fuel subsidies is based on an inventory of the individual measures. And we kind of classify them as direct or indirect. So direct would be coming from a government budget, while indirect would be, you know, ones for maybe the tax system or, or other kinds of supports. We also included um, effective carbon rates and energy tax per litre, and I'll say more about those in the next slide. Um, but just some of the decisions we made, we took a broad definition of um, fossil fuel su supports. Um, you know, we didn't just stick to national accounts type transactions from the budget. Um, we covered, you know, all fossil fuel subsidies, including electricity, much like Costa Rica, we, we, we um, uh, remove the renewable portion and we collected data for 2000 to 2020. So just to say something about those three indicators. You hear, could I ask you just to try to speak up a little bit louder? I think it'll help folks in the room. Uh, just pick up your sure. voice. Sure, yep. So um, to coll we collected data on individual measures, um, you know, because it's useful to policymakers um, to be able to see those um, you know, a list of those with a uh, value on them. Um, they also tell us something about how much support is coming from the budget and how much from the tax system. And they can be used to estimate an, a, a total amount of fossil fuel fuels uh, subsidies. They can also be compared with our data that we've been collecting for the other environmental accounts. Um, so effective carbon rates, maybe the, the main advantage there is more useful for international comparisons because they are not um, just based on the tax system. Effective carbon rates, um, you know, are a measure of the energy tax collected per ton of, of carbon dioxide emitted. And an energy tax per litre, our idea was that that would complement the knowledge of the general public who, especially at the moment, might be, you know, quite aware of the price per litre of fuel at the petrol pump and then they can see how much of that you know, is tax and how much of that in particular specific taxes such as carbon tax. There are some examples of fossil fuel subsidies that we identified here and how we classified them and, you know, where we got the data. So most of the data is based on um, data from, you know, government accounts or the tax agency revenue. And then in certain cases, we had to make our own estimates based on those. So here again, just to relate this then to SDG indicator reporting, you know, this is a table from the release here on the right hand side, and we would be, you, you'll see in the next slide how we kind of um, transpose that into the, the SDG reporting template. Also, just this is a slide on, on indirect or fossil fuel subsidies or tax expenditures, and you can kind of see the importance of them here. That was one of our results in the release that 87% of fossil fuel subsidies in Ireland in 2020 were tax expenditures. So if you just take a look at this jet kerosene excise exemption, for example, here in the data, when we're submitting data um, for the SDG reporting, we are directly taking the name of that subsidy and the, the data and entering it into the template. Now, in terms of metadata, we, we in our release, we have background notes with very detailed um, you know, information about what definitions we used and classifications and so on. And a lot of that is useful for the metadata that's required for SDG reporting as well. But you know, there is a lot um, requested on the reporting template and we don't have it all yet, um, but we're able to, you know, supply a lot of it and, and we, 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 you know, we will do the, the work um, over the coming reporting periods to try to add to that. So these are the background notes to, the rele to our release. And again, that's in case anyone wants to go and look at it afterwards. You know, all of that information about the decisions we made and the definitions we used is there. Um, to be seen along with a list of the individual measures that we identified. Just one final result from our release then, um, you know, we showed a comparison of um, energy taxes, fossil fuel subsidies and environmental subsidies that relate to energy or air emissions in the release. And you can see that, you know, the government took in 2.8 billion in energy taxes in, in 2020. Of that, about 0.4 billion was used to support, you know, environmental, so like renewable energy or energy, efficient, energy efficiency kind of measures or um, 
um, climate change mitigation kind of measures. Um, 2.2 billion then was identified in fossil fuel subsidies. So there were certainly some challenges um, in, this, in doing this work. Um, again, as mentioned before, um, expert, you know, kind of need some expertise ideally in economics, energy markets, the tax system, environmental issues. So consulting with the tax agency, Department of Finance staff is really useful. Um, we found that Department of Energy staff had good knowledge of, kind of cer certain features of the energy market that could provide, you know, support fossil fuel use. Um, and um, economic and environmental agencies, you know, commissioned academic reports on environmental related um, expenditure that we, we also uh, benefited from. Um, and, you know, some of the other difficulties are, you know, just some of it, they're very technical decisions to be made, um, you know, in relation to all of those aspects mentioned above. And, you know, the benchmarks, as also mentioned before, when measuring tax expenditures, um, there are difficult decisions to be made there. Data avail availability can be limited on the other types of, of fossil fuel subsidies we found as well. So the SDG methodology document is um, that Claire mentioned at the beginning, we found that really useful. And I know that work is in progress on another OECD guidance document. And I'm really looking forward to, to um, seeing that as well because we, we need all the help we can get. Um, for anyone who's interested, those are the re this, uh, CSO releases that I mentioned during the talk and um, thank you very much again for the opportunity and please feel welcome to contact me um, afterwards on my email address there. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, I think that was a really fantastic overview of your work. Um, I was really struck by a few things. I thought it was really interesting seeing how the SDG indicator has actually been quite consistent with and kind of supporting a lot of other interesting areas, uh, you know, reporting on, on broader environmentally harmful subsidies, linkages with, you know, creating statistics and effective carbon pricing, um, I was also really struck by um, how much work was spent into thinking about the reporting of the data in Ireland and those quite striking comparisons you kind of gave us where, um, you know, we saw uh, revenues versus uh, subsidization. Uh, I think that's kind of a really interesting example for other countries to think about as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, kind of uh, really interesting also to see the challenges you noted about, you know, uh, definitions being very complicated. Uh, there being challenges with data availability. I, I saw a lot of similarities there between what Laura was chatting about as well. You know, there being some subsidies that maybe aren't quantified yet, but could be later because of these challenges. So um, I think that's something that maybe other countries can anticipate too. So we'll now turn to uh, my colleague, Philip Gass, who's a lead on energy transitions with ISD. So, uh, you know, ISD is also a very long history as a CSO, uh, stretching back many years on, on estimating uh, subsidies independently. Uh, we're not the only civil society organization that is preparing independent estimates of these subsidies. There's a large number, uh, lots of partnerships all around the world working to try to improve data uh, and improve reporting and transparency. So, um, Phil, it would be great to hear from you, uh, listening to all of this, listening to uh, all this info about the SDG indicator, which is really targeted at governments. Uh, what does this mean for CSOs? CSOs are working in this space too. Do they need to know? What this indicator is and is it important for their own work. And um, we're encouraged to use the microphone rather than the stand, it's a little easier for me to hear. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, I've got a few notes here, um, but um, look, I'll try to keep it short. We're getting towards the end of our time. So I think the most important thing is to recognize the work that CSOs have been doing on transparency. And second, what indicator 12C1 means for CSO work uh, in this area. So with subsidies, we've seen a lot of rushed responses over the, the past few years, first with COVID and now with the energy pricing crisis. And CSOs have played a pivotal role in terms of getting good data out and improving transparency. A prime example of this is the energy policy tracker, which took a record of all new public money committed during the core of the COVID-19 pandemic from January 2020 to June, 2021. This was a huge exercise that ISD undertook along with IGIS, OCI, ODI, SEI, and Columbia University, and 23 other organizations that supported us all over the world. Covering 38 countries, we found that 41% of support, about 515 billion US dollars, went to fossil fuel sectors, while only 30% of funds, uh, that, so that was 41% of funds, while less than that, 38% went to clean energy. So there's a lot to be learned from this data, including what not to do in future crises and how to respond during the current one. 
So civil society interest is very high, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of expertise to be uh, to be tapped into. On the second point of what the SDG methodology means for all these CSOs who are active in the space, there's three areas, alignment, accountability, and communications. On alignment, it's really valuable if CSOs can be aware of the SDG indicator methodology and at least consider whether or not their own approaches to identify and estimating subsidies can be aligned with SDG 12C1. When lots of organizations are all creating data, it helps if we speak a common language and it also helps to avoid conversations about unclear, lack of clarity on numbers because not everybody is, is using the same methodologies. IISD's team in India did this uh, with their last two years of subsidy estimates. The main approach followed a separate established WTO methodology, but the data was also categorized and tagged so it would be easy for the government to reorganize around the SDG indicator. This can be uh, this can be really increase the likelihood that CSO data is used by governments later on. On accountability, there's always debates about what should and shouldn't be included in subsidy estimates. And uh, countries that are reported against 12C1 have said that they, they have no fossil fuel subsidies. CSOs can play an important role in investigating what has been reported and identifying gaps. We've seen this already with CSO speaking out in disagreement with some of the G20 peer reviews and their fossil, on fossil fuel subsidies. On communications, data isn't very helpful if no one knows about it and no one uses it. So CSOs can also play a vital role in getting out subsidy estimates. They should apply as, just as much to estimates being produced by governments under 12C1. So those are some of the things uh, I thought I'd highlight about how CSOs can take part in this discussion. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about what governments can get from CSOs. We talk a lot about things like accountability in the space, but it's not always an adversarial relationship. Governments can and have invited CSOs to be part of peer review processes. ISD has participated in peer reviews uh, as, a, as a technical expert. We've seen good examples of this, where a number of CSOs have been encouraged to participate in technical discussions. This is something that governments can, can, can do more often. And when we're all speaking that same language, it makes it easier to do so and easier to find common ground. On a diplomatic level, CSOs are also working with governments, including the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, uh, to increase transparency and accountability. And today, the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform have released a statement on their website about the importance of fossil fuel subsidy reform at the time of an energy price crisis like we're in today. We're here today and we had some representatives from different Friends members at events throughout the day today talking to, about the importance of subsidy reform at this current time and CSOs and governments both jointly participating in this message and speaking the same language on accountability and transparency and measurement is a key ground, a key area where all these organizations can find common ground together. And that's why it's important really to have this, this basis that we can have with 12C1 so we can find that common ground and improve the diplomatic relationships and include the overall momentum on fossil fuel subsidy reform. So thanks, Chris, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Phil. And um, we've talked a lot about transparency today. Uh, I think that we need to be invisible. For those of you here online, you might be looking at a black screen. Uh, we're having some camera problems, so that's why we've become invisible, but we are still very committed to transparency here at COP27. So um, thank you very much for your, your thoughts. So, I mean, thanks to, to all of the speakers who shared this info today. We've got a little bit of time left before we finish. Thank you everybody for bearing with us, pretty online. I know there's a lot of background noise today. Um, we had one, uh, we had a few questions come in actually from uh, Michael Bagamri online. I think one of them has been answered already in the chat, but there was one I wanted to just reserve uh, also to kind of pick up for, for a spoken response. So Michael asked us, um, how do various agencies propose to deal with sub-national governments that often give the most support to fossil fuels, such as um, in countries uh, like Canada? I think that's a really great question. Um, I'd like to maybe turn to uh, Claire Poudevin uh, from UNEP on this. Obviously, UNEP's been providing a lot of assistance to countries and indicator. I thought, Claire, maybe you would be best positioned to share some thoughts about um, you know, countries where uh, there might be a lot of subnational support. Sure. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's indeed a very good question, and um, it, that's that's true. in In some in some countries, um, subnational measures can represent a significant share of these subsidies. And I think the example of Canada you mentioned is is indeed a good one. Um, so the fact is that through this, uh, at least in the context of this SDG twelve C one, we really recommend reporting on both national and subnational level measures. Um, so the template that was developed um, to support the the data reporting um, that we provide to countries uh, really asked to report with quite a lot of detail um, and and to mention if we're talking about for example, national or subnational measures, uh, producer or consumer support, uh, the type of fuel, the subtype of fuel. So it, it is really, really detailed. Um, and so maybe to go back to, to Michael's question, um, the, the way we, we recommend to deal with it in, in the context of this indicator is to just apply the same methodology, both at national and subnational levels, and, and just to be as transparent about it as, as possible. I hope that replies to your question. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I don't see any other speakers looking very keen to respond to that specific point, so I, I won't invite anybody else to reply. I, I think one thing I can say, though, is maybe to pick up on um, some of the points that my colleague Phil shared as well. I think this is also an area where civil society activity can be particularly helpful. Uh, in India, for example, ISDs have great collaborations with CEW on creating national subsidy inventories. Obviously, India is a very complicated country. There's a lot of things that are only decided at a state level. And I think kind of networks of CSOs who are working together and also kind of collaboratively with governments to also help kind of point out some of these data gaps and identify ways that they can fill in can also be particularly constructive. Um, so I, I think we should maybe uh, get to our own. Oh, I can see we're back online. So hello there, everybody. Uh, I think that uh, given all of our, our noise, maybe we should try to wrap up. Um, I just want to kind of pitch maybe one final question to, to all of the panelists today. Uh, I'll be slightly provocative with my question. I think that we have been having conversations about measuring fossil fuel subsidies for a long time. I think there's a lot of people out there who feel very frustrated about the progress that we're making on climate change and they feel that measuring things you know, isn't good enough. Um, we need to, to move more on action. Obviously today, I think we've discussed in some detail and shown why measuring things is really, really important. But we know that we're, we're not as far ahead as we'd like to be. Uh, we have had a relatively small number of countries reporting under SG 12.C.1. Uh, so I just like to kind of throw the question uh, to all speakers to respond to, you know, 30 seconds. Um, what do you think we can do so that one year from now we're not in the same spot? And actually, you know, we're chatting about um, transparency under this measure. Um, we have a large uh, number of countries who have uh, reported and we're having a, a more substantive conversation about what we can do about the subsidies we have identified as opposed to uh, the ones that we would like to measure. So uh, I'll maybe start um, with uh, our speakers uh, online. So maybe uh, Claire Poudevin, uh, I'll turn first to you again. Thank you. Um, so I think there are many ways to 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 answer your question. So I'll I'll just take one angle, and I'm sure others can cover others. Uh, maybe in a way that partly answers also a question that was just asked uh, online about the role of the WTO, um, which I think here can be relevant indeed. Um, Going further in um, interagency coordination, so I think the work that uh, UNEP has been doing with ISD and OECD, but also other partners, is is really helpful in crossing uh, those efforts and databases. Um, and there is at the moment at the WTO more and more discussion happening and technical um, technical working groups happening on the topic of fossil fuel subsidies that uh, UNEP and I think ISD as well has been participating in. So yeah, um, going further, I think. Um, additional efforts in in uh, between development partners and and uh, and uh, uh, technical agencies is uh, is quite key here. And I'll leave the floor to someone else. Thank you very much. Can I just check everyone online can still hear us? It looks like we had a bit of a connection problem. Are you still with us? We can hear you. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear us. Okay, great. Very glad to know you're still there. So, uh, Laura, over to you. What can we do? How can we increase the, the level of reporting under this indicator? Yeah, I, I think uh, a very important thing is the capacity building uh, among institutions. Because, uh, for example, in our case, we have been working in, in share, um, providing data, with, we would say, for the low-hanging fruits. 
like the data that is easy to, to find. But now uh, we are facing like more challenges and some concepts are not clear. So I think capacity building is a very important thing at a uh, national level and sharing experiences from other countries, successful experiences, like uh, countries like Ireland that have been uh, very active in this, uh, in this topic for years. I think it, it's good to that other countries can know about this and the different point of views and uh, the indicators, the additional indicators that we should be uh, using. So I think it's sharing information, capacity building and uh, communication overall. Super, thank you very much. Um, Clara, Clara Hara. Thank you. Um, you know, I work in the, the National Statistics Institute, so probably, you know, we, we stop at, at measuring and we're hoping that government departments and so on will take over and use our data then to, um, you know, make implement policy measures. And we kind of have some good news from that point of view, you know, whereas the Department of Finance Aid just used to produce a budget, they now produce a report on tax expenditures and they also produce a report on tax expenditures involving environmentally positive and environmentally negative expenditure and they they've been using our data to do that we also get a lot of coverage in the media of you know now that since we've been producing these statistics and obviously that's kind of negative coverage so um you know i would hope that kind of the data that we're producing will kind of um stimulate some changes and what we'd like to see when we're looking at our statistics is those figures on fossil fuel subsidies swapping over with the figures on environmentally motivated subsidies you know so that fuel fossil fuel supports come down and renewables and energy efficiency measures and so on come up so we can we'll be tracking you know we can track that with our data thank you thank you very much phil Yeah, sure. So, uh, look, I'll be really brief. I, I think we're looking ahead to a year of uncertainty um, in, in Europe and the world and energy price crisis. So I said it earlier today, I think we have to be prepared for anything. I think we have to understand that there might be some short term subsidies that are needed for energy security or access reasons, but we can't let that we can't lose sight of the longer term energy transition and the need to reform and remove fossil fuel subsidies as soon as possible. And anything that is in place in the short term for access or security reasons has to be short term, transparent, and very importantly, coming back to the theme of our discussion now, accurately reported so that we know the scale of the problem we're dealing with so that we can more quickly deal with that problem. And the last word to Michael Mullen. So I guess I'm kind of slightly hidden away in the back here. Um, well, no, I think just to say, I think this effort and transparency is essential. We need to understand the scope of the problem. We need to continue to publicize not just the headline figures, but also how the trends within that are moving. And we need to build the continued political momentum to finally you know, move from an up and down situation to genuinely meeting the commitments that have been met. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who joined us today uh, for staying online, for putting up with our, our technical problems. Um, I think thanks to all of our speakers, thanks to all the organizations around the world, frankly, who've been working so hard to get this data out there so we can try to promote better decision makings. Uh, as um, you know, we've heard uh, subsidies are too big. Uh, they're uh, as large now as they were uh, back in 2010. Uh, this year is a high oil price year, so they're likely to be even much larger once we've got data for 2022, the data we shared to you today is 2021. So uh, we, uh, we desperately need to get more progress to make sure that countries are monitoring this so that we can then improve accountability and improve kind of targeted action to solve this problem. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And um, uh, we'll, we'll close now. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, please uh, continue to follow us online at COP. Uh, we'll be communicating about this issue. Check, uh, check out our website, fossilfuelsubsidytracker.org. Uh, the latest numbers that were shared today by Michael will be updated there in a week or two from now. So they should uh, soon be fully publicly available.